True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Young mom and skilled pilot, Kelsey Barrett was last seen on Thanksgiving Day, 2018. After not hearing from her daughter for over a week, her mother, Cheryl Barreth, reported Kelsey missing. Authorities contacted Kelsey's fiancé, Patrick Frazee, but he said the two had recently broken up. As the search for Kelsey began, police investigated Frazee and learned about another woman in his life, Crystal Lee Kenny. The story eventually told by Kenny exposed a months-long plot leading up to a horrific crime. Join us at The Quiet End today for a closer look into the disappearance of 29-year-old Kelsey Barreth. The details of this crime, along with its planning and its cover-up, has left her family heartbroken, and many of us wondering if there is any true justice for Kelsey. So this is a Colorado case. Of course, I have a Colorado beer. The one I chose today is Maharaja, from Avery Brewing Company in Boulder. It's a big old IPA. And this isn't the first time that we've been drinking an Avery. No, we've had some other Averys. Okay. Um, but this is this is the IPA. It's a very nice one. Amber-colored beer, big, huge head, very sticky, lacy appearance, a nice aroma of malt, some floral hops, some herbal hops, and the taste is mostly pine, a lot of hoppy pine taste. And a little bit of bread. Very nice. Big, 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 big hoppy beer. Okay. So. I don't know what this says about me, but whenever you say big, big head and sticky lace, there's some kind of sexualness to it. Well, you must have a mind (laughs) that works that way. I guess I'm in the gutter. Well, let's open it up and give it a try. We will. Okay. It's 2020. Let's go down to the quiet end for our first podcast of the year. First of the year. Quiet end looks quiet. Just getting ready. Okay, why don't you go ahead and start our story? I will. So it was Kelsey's mom, Cheryl, who contacted the police to report Kelsey missing. This was on December 2nd, 2018. Cheryl hadn't spoken to her daughter in over a week. Now, Kelsey's infant daughter, Kaylee, had been in the custody of her father and Kelsey's fiancé, Patrick Frazee, since Thanksgiving Day. And it wasn't like Kelsey to be out of touch without explanation. Right. So right away, alarm bells were ringing. Yeah, this just isn't like Kelsey. No. Very responsible, smart young woman. Right. And Kelsey actually grew up on a farm in Washington State. She had a younger brother, Clinton, and loved horses. And she always had dreams of becoming a commercial pilot according to her mother. Yeah, and she she went to aviation school in Washington and then began working professionally as a flight instructor. So I'm very impressed by that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, not everybody can do that. In 2016, she met Patrick Frazee in an online, what, dating site type of thing? Yeah. She moved to Colorado to be near him, so things uh, heated up pretty quickly. Yes, she really liked him. She thought he was a keeper and he could be the one. Could be. At least she was well enough into him that she made a big move. Right. Yeah, that shows something, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you have to be fairly committed to do that. One would think. So, Frazee worked and lived on his mother's ranch, where he trained cattle dogs. And he also worked as a farrier. Now, for those of you who don't know, like me, a farrier is a specialist in equine hoof care. It includes the trimming and balancing of horses' hooves and putting shoes on their hooves. Right, and not just horses, I guess donkeys as well. He had a friend with donkeys who he used to take care of their hooves. Well, I guess a hoof is a hoof, right? I think so. So Kelsey worked as a flight instructor at Falcon Air Force Base before she accepted the position at DOS Aviation in Pueblo, Colorado. Her boss at DOS said that Kelsey was diligent and committed. She commuted from her condo in Woodland Park to her job in Pueblo several days a week. People who flew with her remembered her as a very positive force in their lives and as someone that they could really trust. 
When her students graduated, they left some glowing reviews of her large knowledge base and her very helpful teaching techniques. So she was really well regarded there. So it seems. And she had moved into her own condo in the town of Woodland Park, and that's not far from Frazee's ranch. The two became engaged, and they had a baby girl in the fall of 2017. They named her Kaylee. Frazee seemed happy to be a father and seemed to take good care of Kaylee. But Kelsey and Patrick didn't live together. However, her and Kelsey's family felt the relationship was a good one. The parents shared custody, making plans to be together as a family at some point. Right, so I kind of see right from the beginning here a lack of commitment on his part that they weren't living together after they had a baby. Well, it seems a little strange to me. Yeah, if you're co-parenting and you're engaged to be married, why wouldn't you live together? Right. So that's just kind of a red flag that I noticed right away in the beginning of this story. Yeah, and was it more his decision that they did not live together? Or? Well, we don't know. You know, her mother had said it was financial things, which I think it was mostly him because he was the one who had financial problems, which we'll get into. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the missing persons report and what first happened. Okay. So the first police officer who showed up to do a welfare check on Kelsey was Corporal Beth Huber, and after entering Kelsey's information into the local and national databases, she contacted Patrick Frazee. So right away, they're going to contact the fiancé. Well, of course. Now, Frazee claimed that the last time he had seen Kelsey was Thanksgiving Day. That was November 22nd, when they had exchanged custody of Kaylee in uh, the alley behind Kelsey's condo. Now, Frazee said their romantic relationship was over. During the, the custody exchange, he returned items that belonged to Kelsey. This included her handgun, some ammunition, car keys, house keys, and some other personal items. Right. So custody exchange in the alley is another weird thing. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And also saying that their relationship was over. Nobody else knew of that, and there was no evidence to show that. And we'll notice that when we look at their conversations around this time. Kelsey's family reported to police that it was highly unusual for her to go away without telling anyone. Her mom, Cheryl, had spoken to Kelsey twice on the phone on November 22nd. And to her, Kelsey seemed like her normal, happy self. She talked excitedly about the upcoming Christmas holiday with Kaylee, what kind of presents they would have for her, stuff like that. Then after talking to her mom, Kelsey went shopping with Kaylee. She was caught on video surveillance at a Safeway store in Woodland Park. And she entered the store at 12.05, everything looks normal, and exited the Safeway at 12.27 p.m. And this would also be verified by receipts from the store. So after leaving the store, Kelsey sent Frazee a text, and she offered to make him a sweet potato casserole. That doesn't really sound like someone who's broken up. It sure doesn't. It sounds like uh, a good relationship. Yeah, at least one that she's, you know, invested in for sure. That's right. Then between 12.54 and 1.17, that same day, Frazee was captured on a Walmart surveillance camera at the Woodland Park Walmart. He had a baby carrier with a blanket that looked like the blanket seen with Kelsey and Kaylee at the Safeway. Now, Kaylee couldn't be seen, but it's probable that she is with Frazee because he had the carrier. Sure, I think that's a pretty safe assumption. But Kelsey wasn't seen again after Thanksgiving Day even though her cell phone continued to send messages. On November 24th, Cheryl got a text from Kelsey's phone saying that she would call her later, but then Kelsey never called her. The next day, there was a text from Kelsey's phone to her supervisor at DOS Aviation. It said she was planning to take a trip and would be away for a week. There were also messages to Patrick Frazee. On the 24th at 4 p.m., Frazee sent a text to Kelsey's phone saying, if this is truly what you want, I'll respect your wishes and give you space. I'll leave you alone now. Then the next day, there was a text from Kelsey's phone to Frazee's phone saying, Do you even love me? And he answered that text with, Why would I bend over backwards and stand by you through everything if I didn't? So the answer to your question is, yes, I do. So after about a week of not hearing from her daughter, Cheryl Barrett called Frazee. And just to see, you know, what's going on. 
Frazee told Cheryl that he and Kelsey had an argument and Kelsey had broken up with him and given Kaylee to him. He suggested to Cheryl that Kelsey may have flown off somewhere with a co-worker, but Kelsey hadn't told Cheryl about a trip or breaking up with Frazee. So Mom, Cheryl, is getting more and more concerned, and that's when she called the police. So at the welfare check of Kelsey's condo, her keys and purse were gone, but both of her cars were parked outside. They didn't find any signs of foul play on this visit, but her makeup and toothbrush were still in the bathroom, and there were some mostly uneaten cinnamon rolls sitting on the stove. There was also a candle on a warmer nearby, and the heat was up higher than usual. So these are all very strange things. She wouldn't leave for a trip without her makeup and her toothbrush, leaving food on the counter. Or turning the thermostat down. Right. Right. So by this time, ten days had passed since Kelsey had last been seen. Remember, Cheryl got a text from Kelsey, but we don't believe that that last one was from Kelsey because she was already missing. Right. Your impression is that it's a doctored kind of thing. Yeah. It's just to throw people off. Right. And even Cheryl would say that the texting wasn't like her daughter's texting. So there were some red flags right away on the whole thing. There was a press conference held on December 4th, and the case was still being treated as a missing persons case. Police announced that Kelsey's phone had pinged on a tower in Gooding, Idaho on November 25th. This was a long way from where Kelsey lived. I think it was 800 to 1,000 miles. So Cheryl spoke about her daughter being a reliable person, and she asked for help in locating her. But notably, Patrick Frazee did not attend this press conference. And of course, everybody noticed that. Well, sure. So December 6th, which is two weeks after Kelsey had last been seen, Cheryl and Clinton Barreth were staying at Kelsey's condo. Now, Clinton was cleaning the condo, and he noticed a blood spot on the toilet bowl. So a crime scene analyst from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation went to the condo and confirmed that the spot was, in fact, blood. A chemical was used on the rest of the bathroom, and they were tested positive for blood pretty much all over the room. Toilet, bathtub, towel rack, door handle, floor, walls, even the ceiling. So that's very alarming. It sure is. Someone had worked to try to remove all the blood, but there was a residue that had been left behind. Cheryl Barrett also told police that a bath rug was missing from the bathroom. So these are all bad signs. These don't look good, do they? No. So December 13th, police obtained a search warrant for Frazee's cattle ranch. And during the search, a bottle of bleach and a Swiffer mop were found, which tested positive for blood. They also found a document with a list of five people who could provide medical care for Kaylee in his absence. This was dated December 12th, 2018. And Kelsey's name was not on that list. Right. That's strange. Very. They found it strange. I mean, they really took that to mean that he knew Kelsey was gone. Right. Yeah. Because why wouldn't you have the mother of the child on the list? Exactly. And why was the list even created at that point? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it was alarming, the whole thing. So Frazee was kind of trying to set up stories about Kelsey that weren't true, kind of presenting her as an unstable person. Yeah, he told people that he knew that Kelsey had substance abuse issues, and she sometimes just took off on her own. He also said that she had left before and checked into rehab. Then he suggested that she might have even be suicidal. Her gun was missing from her home. Now, Frazee said he had taken the gun from her before because he was afraid she had hurt herself. Right. Now, there were no records of her ever being in rehab or having a drinking issue. I would think, for one thing, if you go into rehab for substance abuse, you're not going to be a flight instructor unless you're under strict supervision for that. You're probably not. Right. Now, there was a time a while back where she had gone to like a weekend retreat for therapy and, you know, for being anxious, but nothing about substance abuse and nothing about being suicidal. Now, police searched through cell phone communication records between Kelsey and Patrick Frazee's cell phone. Frazee had reported that he was in cell phone contact with Kelsey through the 25th of November, and nothing since. 
Yeah, so let's look at these records a little bit. November 22nd, between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., there were 10 contacts between Kelsey and Frazee's phones. And one of these contacts was a four-minute phone call that was about 1.40 a.m. There were five texts between the phones on November 23rd, one on the 24th, and three more on the 25th. And there were also several calls between the two during that time frame. So the analysis of the cell phone data showed that Kelsey and Frazee's cellular phones were both connecting to the same Verizon tower in Woodland Park at 12.33 p.m. on November 22nd, when Kelsey's cell phone returned a missed call from Frazee that had come into her phone just two minutes before that. Then both phones pinged at the same towers on the evening of the 22nd, traveling in the same direction. And this, according to Frazee, would be after they had already broken up and he had left with Kaylee. But this told the police that these two phones had been traveling together. So there's there's a little difference of fact here, right? Yes. He, he said, we, we're done, we're, we've broken up, and here we have the cell phones traveling together. Well, basically, it's telling them that he's being deceitful. Yep. Then on the 23rd of November, both the cell phones used the same cell tower near Frazee's ranch when Frazee called Kelsey's phone that morning. Later that day, both phones traveled together from his residence to an area in the west before returning to his residence. So what do you think about these cell tower pings? I mean, I know we've done other cases where they weren't completely accurate, like people would be in one place and their phone would use a tower 10 or 12 miles away, even though there was a tower closer. But from what I could read about it, it seems like it's better now. I mean, this is 2018, so I think that they were more believable, more accurate. Well, there's that, and it's also, uh, you're looking at both phones kind of together. Well, well, sure. I think that's a pretty accurate way of looking at it. Not, yeah. Not that one was in one place and one was at another place. Right, and, you know, this cell phone data plays a big role in this case, huge. It certainly does. Yeah, I think it's one of the cases that has the most cell phone data being evidence that of anything we've ever covered. Because we have information, you know, about Kelsey and Frazee, and then we're going to have a third party. Pretty soon. Right. So November 24th, both Kelsey and Frazee's phones used the Verizon cell tower near his ranch and one to the west of the ranch at the same times. Further analysis showed that Kelsey's cell phone traveled from Colorado by I-70 into Utah and I-15, going through Salt Lake City and then into Idaho on the evening of the 24th into the morning of the 25th. So the last activity for Kelsey's phone was on the 25th at 5.13 p.m., but it was coming from a tower in Gooding, Idaho. Now, there's no way her phone in Woodland Park is going to ping in Idaho. <laughs> no. No. So the Gooding County Sheriff's Office searched the area, couldn't find the phone. Then as they're looking at Frazee's phone records, they learned that Frazee had been communicating with a phone with an Idaho area code. Very interesting. They found out that the Idaho cell number belonged to a 32-year-old mother of two. She was a registered nurse named Crystal Lee Kenny. Yeah, so of course this is important. Why is he communicating with this person so much? And could she be involved? Yeah, this is opening up a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Well, Kenny had actually known Frazee for about 12 years. They dated way back in 2006, and after they broke up, Penny got married. She married a guy named Chad Lee. But according to friends and people who knew her really well, Kenny was still in love with Frazee when she got married to Lee, and she would admit that later on. So Kenny and Frazee reconnected in 2015, and that's when they began having an affair, which I believe was kind of an on-again, off-again affair. In March of 2016, Kenny said she found out she was pregnant with Frazee's child. And by now, she's already got two children of her own with her husband. So she ended that pregnancy, but she lied and told Frazee she'd had a miscarriage. Then she filed for divorce from her husband in May of 2016. Definitely, that divorce was related to her feelings for Frazee. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind about that. 
Oh, sure. Now, she continued to see Frazee on occasion, uh, even continuing after Frazee and Kelsey's baby was born. Uh, she continued to see him and continued to be sexually active with him. Yeah, so the thing is that Frazee never went and visited Kelsey at her condo, according to her friends. She always went to him. And it seems to be similar with his relationship with Henny. So he seemed to have some kind of power over these women, and he was very controlling of them. I mean, he definitely seemed to have the upper hand in these relationships. I'm not sure why. Maybe just because he's an abusive jerk. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. So FBI agents called Kenny on December 14th and interviewed her by telephone. Now, during the interview, she gave false information, false end and misleading information. During the interview, she was asked when the last time was that she had communicated with, with Frazee. She said she wasn't sure. Uh, she'd have to look through her phone. Now, when pressed for an answer, she said between a month and a month and a half ago. But then she turned around and said, well, you know, I, I was at Frazee's ranch on Saturday, November 24th, 2018. She said she had been there from about 9 in the morning to 5 in the evening to look at a horse. She said she returned home Sunday morning after driving through the night. So it took eight hours, huh, to look at a horse? That's exactly what I was just going to ask. How long does it take to look at a horse? I wouldn't think more than an hour. Wouldn't take very long. No, but that's going to turn out to be another lie anyway. Kenny also said she had never met Kelsey and had no idea who she was until she saw the news about Kelsey's disappearance online. But the thing is, she was well aware that Frazee had a daughter. So wouldn't it be strange for her to know that he had a daughter, but know nothing about the mother? I mean, I could believe maybe she never met the mother, but you think she'd at least know her name. Yeah, right? Yeah, plus yeah. I think if you see on the news she's missing, you're going to see that connection. Although I guess she wasn't denying knowing it at that point. No. But I still think it's really weird that she would spend all day with him, know about his daughter and claimed to know nothing about the mother of his baby. Yeah, yeah, I, I see you have a baby. <laughs> Where'd well, it come from? Yeah, you know. Yeah, somebody gave birth to that baby. Now, there were call records between Frazee and Kenny on the 24th of November several times, 7.23 a.m., 10.47 a.m., 11.39 a.m., 1.06 p.m., and 5.21 p.m. Now, this is when Kenny was claiming to be at Frazee's ranch. So that doesn't make any sense. Why would she be calling him and talking on the phone with him? If she's at his ranch. If she's there with him looking at a horse. So now we have two people who are lying to the police, and the police are well aware of that. So of course they're putting this together. Mm -hmm. Further analysis showed that Kenny's phone was connecting to not only a tower that serviced Kelsey's residence, but a specific sector of that tower on November 24th. So that's pretty strong evidence that she was around Kelsey's place. That tower didn't even service Frazee's ranch, so this led investigators to believe that Kenny was lying about being at that ranch that day. At least she hadn't been there all day. Exactly. But she denied that Frazee had asked her to take Kelsey's phone and destroy it. Yeah, then investigators did know that Kenny's phone had traveled back to Idaho on the 24th and 25th of November. And her phone was connected to the exact same tower and sector in a remote area of the Colorado-Utah border on the morning of the 25th at 4.13, 4.16, and 4.23 a.m. Kelsey's phone was connected at 4.11 and 4.16. So this showed that Kenny was probably in possession of Kelsey's phone. And also, on her recent trip to Idaho, Kenny had been communicating with Frazee right after the last activity of Kelsey's phone. Yeah, so this is almost like a puzzle that they're putting together. But it's pretty simple, actually. Yeah, it is. I mean, this, this cell phone data, the towers, and all that, very, very interesting stuff. Well, it tells them a lot. It sure did. That they probably wouldn't have found out otherwise. Which leads me to think, were these people that stupid? that you don't think they're going to be able to tell that you're texting the phones in the same place? They don't know about towers and pings at all? I guess they don't watch enough crime shows. <laughs> that could be the problem, yeah. 
But really, I mean, everybody kind of knows nowadays about your phone's going to, you know, your phone is pretty much tracking you constantly where you are. You don't even have to use it. Right. Right. So Crystal Lee Kenny was interviewed by FBI and CBI agents in person on December 17th. She said that she'd be happy to cooperate, but she wanted an attorney with her, which happened. They got a lawyer. Yeah. So the telephone interview, she lied. And her husband, her ex-husband, would tell police that she had lied. The things that she had told him were lies as well. And then, you know, I hate to say she was kind of smart about it because I hate her. But she was kind of smart in that she got an attorney. And she got herself a plea deal before she would give them any information. So that's another thing to think about. Do we really need her to tell us the information? Or could she have been prosecuted for bigger crimes without getting a deal? So that's just something I'd like you to think about as we get further into this. Now, Kenny was living with her ex-husband, Chad, in Idaho with their two kids. She lied to him where she was or where she had been on November 24th and 25th. Now, first, she told him she was going to a birthday party at a friend's house in Idaho. But then she changed her story, saying she was going to help her friend Megan move Megan lived in Idaho also. So Kenny drove her friend Megan Garrison's 2012 black Volkswagen Jetta to Colorado. Megan was interviewed and stated that she wanted to borrow Kenny's truck, so they switched cars. She had known that Kenny planned to drive to Colorado, but claimed not to know the reason for that. Right, so I'm not so sure if Megan was telling the whole truth, because I think she might have known a little more than she was saying there. There's a possibility. Yeah. In the December 17th interview, Kenny said that Frazee was talking about killing Kelsey for months. As early as September of 2018, he had approached Kenny with some plans to murder Kelsey. And according to Kenny, Frazee had told her that Kelsey was an abusive mother who had physically harmed their baby multiple times, including saying that she burned Kaylee's hands with her curling iron. But there's not any evidence of any abuse by Kelsey. And everyone who knew her, and pretty much everyone who knew Frazee, thinks it's highly unlikely. Now, she also told the police that between September 1st and November 22nd, Frazee had solicited her to murder Kelsey at least three times. And she said she had taken some steps to do this, but hadn't followed through. So (laughs) she couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I guess Frazee had told her to get a burner phone to conceal her involvement, but she hadn't done that. And then he was discussing drugging Kelsey's coffee and hitting Kelsey in the head with a metal bar. But Kenny had drove out to Kelsey's place. She admitted to going to Starbucks and buying Kelsey's favorite drink, a caramel macchiato, and taking it to Kelsey's condo one day. Frazee had wanted her to put Valium and Ambien in the coffee to overdose Kelsey but she said she didn't put anything in the coffee. She had gone to Kelsey's door and pretended to be a friendly neighbor and had given her the coffee, saying, well, thanks for putting my dog back in the yard or something like that. So according to Kenny, Kelsey did take the coffee inside, but she wasn't very friendly or open to Kenny being there. And Kenny said she hadn't put any medications in that coffee. Now she called it poisoning the coffee. I don't know if that would actually technically be poisoning. No, probably not. No. I mean, if, if the purpose of it was to sedate her. Well, no, I think the purpose was to kill her, not just sedate her. And I think they would have had a hard time doing that with Ambien and Valium, for one thing. Yeah. It would take an awful lot, and you would taste it in the coffee. But, you know, that's just a side thought. It's not really pertinent either way. But she did say she did go to the condo, and she did bring her the coffee, but she didn't put anything in it. Kenny then said that Frazee was angry at her that she didn't go through with it. Then he got a metal pipe and told her to go to Kelsey's and hit her in the head with it, basically beat her to death. But Kenny backed out again and returned the pipe after driving out to Kelsey's condo a second time. So I do believe that she didn't want to murder anyone. No, I mean, the dose in the coffee is one thing. Telling your, your girlfriend, your lover, here's a pipe, go whack her in the head with it. That'd be a little tough to do. I think both are pretty tough to do. I don't really see a big difference between the two methods. 
Oh, sure. I guess more one is more upfront and yeah. you know bloody. But either way, to do that to someone, I would hope would be tough for most people. Now, Crystal Kenny's friend Megan knew about Frazee trying to get Kenny to kill Kelsey. Kenny had come to her and told her that Frazee wanted her to kill his baby mama. And Megan's story matched Crystal's story. Megan's story matched Kenny's story. Right. So Crystal Kenny had said that he was asking her to kill Kelsey. I don't know. She's kind of asking advice about what do I do? Because according to Megan, she was upset. But I don't know why Megan didn't call the police right then. To me, that seems like an unethical thing to do, to not call the police when you hear something like that. Well, it would be a good idea to do that, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, absolutely, yes. So back on November 22nd, Frazee called Crystal Lee Kenny and told her to come to Colorado. He told her that she had a mess to clean up. And this is where the story just becomes unbelievable to me. Well, she certainly knew what Frazee meant by that, right? She did, which is really scary because I would think most people, if they thought that a murder had happened, would be pretty freaked out and wouldn't want to have anything to do with it. Well, I guess you could say that this showed the uh, amount of control that Frazee had over her. Yeah, I suppose it does. But does that excuse her? I don't think so. No. No, especially once she gets there, right? Well, I think, again, in retrospect, it was pretty smart of her to get that plea deal. Oh, absolutely. So she had told him she couldn't get to Kelsey's until November 24th. And then when she did finally go to Kelsey's, she brought gloves, bleach, a hairnet, disposable coveralls, shoe covers, and a bunch of cleaning supplies. Cell phone records support that Frazee and Kenny had communicated on the 22nd. So her story is checking out. You know, this time. She did lie the first time, remember? She did. So I just feel like if police hadn't called her out and found out things from these phone records, she probably never would have spoken. I don't feel like it's something she wanted to do, which is really creepy, right? Because if she knows that he killed the woman he was with before her, how could you ever be comfortable being with someone like that? I mean, even if you're cold-blooded and don't give a shit about anyone but yourself, wouldn't you have some concern for yourself being with such a violent person? <laughs> yeah. And does that make sense to you? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's a senseless thing. Anyway, I don't, I don't see how she could do what she did. Right, I don't either. So according to Kenny, Kelsey's condo was awash in blood when she had arrived there. Kelsey's body wasn't there. But there was blood on curtains, pillows, Kelsey's purse, the walls, the ceiling, the floor. Many of uh, baby Kaylee's things, books and toys, had blood on them. So some, some she was able to clean, some she had to dispose of. And as she cleaned, she filled trash bags with things to get rid of. And she spent hours cleaning. So what's going through her mind at this point, Dick? You're a smart guy. So she's in this condo, and she's cleaning up the blood of a woman, a young mother. I mean, remember, Crystal Kenny's a mother of two. So you think she'd have some empathy for another mother. But no, I guess not. And what's going through her mind as she's doing this? I mean, something is telling her it's okay. I know. So I don't get it. I have, I don't have any special insight into that. Yeah, because I don't believe that she was afraid of him and that's why she did it. If she was afraid of him, you call the police immediately. They find the blood. He's locked up. There's nothing to fear. Right. So I just, when I try and imagine her going through for hours cleaning this, it just horrifies me. I mean, just horrific. Well, and she really cleaned. I mean, it's not like she just gave a cursory brush off of stuff. She, she was there for hours. Yeah, so that shows real effort to me. Right. So she's going to say later something like she purposely left some drops of blood here and there for the police. I don't buy that for a moment. No. I think this was a tough scene to clean. And, you know, she probably did a pretty good job because when the police first came in to do the welfare check, they didn't notice anything amiss. So she did do a pretty good job because usually when you hear of something like this, they go in to check the place and there's either the strong smell of bleach you know, or there's blood on a door frame. There's usually something obvious. Yeah, and even when Kelsey's mother and brother were cleaning the place, 
they didn't notice stuff right away. No, it uh, wasn't like it was, an obvious thing. Yeah, it was kind of a fortuitous thing that they saw the blood, or he saw the blood on the toilet. Yeah. So, and here's the other thing that, that gets me. She grabbed the bloody items, the bags of bloody items, and put them in her car and left. Then she went to Sonic for some lunch and then went out to Frazee's ranch. So she spent hours cleaning up this blood-filled house. Knowing that a young woman died there, a horrible right. death. But got to get some food. Jeez. Well, you know, people get hungry regardless, so I don't know what to say about that. But the fact that she goes out to Frazee's ranch afterward shows more complicity to me. Yep. I mean, that shows me she's very complicit. Plus, let's remember, there was a lot of talking back and forth between these two. There was. And how many opportunities did she have to tell the police or warn Kelsey or something? She absolutely had the power to prevent this horrible crime from happening. Absolutely she did. So she goes back to Frazee's ranch, spent three or four hours, and then back to Kelsey's condo because she was going to send a text from Kelsey's phone to Kelsey's mother. Right, so she's super involved. So, well, she's deep into this. She's very deep into it, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I just, her getting that plea deal doesn't settle well. It makes my stomach kind of hurt. I don't like it. So it must imagine how Kelsey's family and friends feel about it. It would be really hard to know that this woman's around after being so deeply involved and having the power to stop it and doing nothing. Well, I remember one of the documentaries we watched, the... Uh prosecutor was was in tears discussing that. Mm -hmm. This was a horrible, horrible death. Yeah. And it was such a betrayal. Something about uh, making a deal with the devil. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if you hit someone in the head, it's difficult to kill them, right? You just don't hit someone in the head with a bat and that's it. Well, she was pummeled. Yeah. She was hit multiple times. So it's very, very violent. Yeah. Brazy had told Kenny the details, too. So there's another reason I just can't stand her. He'd used a baseball bat to kill Kelsey in the living room of her condo. He said he'd tied a sweater around Kelsey's eyes and was having her guess the scents of different candles. And while she was blindfolded, he just came up behind her and hit her in the head. And he said something like he went to swinging, something awful like that. Yeah. So he was concerned that he had left one of Kelsey's teeth in the condo. He had told that to Crystal Kenny because as he was bludgeoning her, he had knocked several of her teeth out. And this is just heart-wrenching. He destroyed this pretty young woman. Yeah, Kenny said that she did find the tooth, but she had disposed of it. She told investigators that she had purposely left traces of blood in the condo for the police to find so they could solve the crime. I don't believe that for an instant. I don't either. I think that's total horseshit. Now, Kaylee was in the condo when her mother was murdered. Frazee told Kenny that Kaylee had been inside a playpen in a bedroom. Frazee's phone was confirmed by a Verizon tower to be in the location of Kelsey's home between 1 and 4.30 in the afternoon on the 22nd. Yeah, so he'd spent a considerable amount of time there. Yep. So Frazee said he first took Kelsey's body in his truck and stored it in a black plastic tote. He hid it at the Nash Ranch on the 22nd. The tote was left in a barn on top of a haystack after he used a tractor to lift it up high on the stack. Furniture store surveillance camera caught images of Frazee traveling back and forth between Kelsey's condo and the ranch. And he later took the tote from the Nash Ranch to his own ranch on the afternoon of the 24th. And Kenny went with Frazee to Nash Ranch to get the body. So there's another thing that she was very involved. I don't mean to be a broken record, but come on. She was so involved in this. So when they got to Frazee's ranch, he put the black tote in a trough on his ranch, along with some items from Kelsey's condo that Crystal had brought. Also the bat that he had used to kill Kelsey. The trough was a round aluminum structure that could hold 100 gallons, and Kenny said he used motor oil, gasoline, and kept adding wood to keep the fire hot and going. She said that he used at least five gallons of gas, burning Kelsey's body. Frazee had wanted Kenny to take Kelsey's body back to Idaho, but she refused to do that. She said that she didn't see Kelsey's body prior to the fire because it was in the tote, but then at one point, as the tote was melting, 
she saw a human body on fire. This is just surreal to me. It's horrifying. Isn't it horrifying? She even said that at one point, Frazee's mother came out on the porch or something and saw the fire. Of course, she probably didn't see what was burning. I'm not implying that. But it's just horrific that they're standing there having this fire. Yep. So late on that evening of November 24th, Frazee gave Kenny Kelsey's cell phone and Kelsey's gun. He wanted Kelsey's gun to be missing to encourage the idea that she'd gone off and possibly killed herself. Kenny put Kelsey's purse and its contents into the fire. Kenny admitted to using Kelsey's cell phone in Woodland Park, Grand Junction, Utah, and Idaho. And she said she was in love with Patrick and she was afraid of him. Now, police records supported Kenny's new version of events. Surveillance footage was found of Frazee outside of Kelsey's condo between 1.30 and 4.30 on the day she was killed. And there was also a video of him at a Conoco station filling a gas container on the 24th. Now, Frazee was arrested for first-degree murder on the 21st of December, even though Kelsey's body had not been found. When considering a motive, the idea that Kelsey was abusing Kaylee was dismissed. It came out that Frazee had some financial issues, and the motive could have been to get custody of Kaylee and get out of paying child support. Yeah, Frazee also had a $72,000 loan that he was late on payments. He'd been paying Kelsey $700 a month in child support, but his last payment had been $150 short. So that shows you that he was having difficulty. Frazee and his siblings were in a legal dispute also over their father's $400,000 estate. Their father had just died in August of 2018. So according to his brother, Sean Frazee, who's a Colorado Springs police officer, he and Patrick hadn't really been close for two to three years. They hadn't had a falling out or anything, they just hadn't been close. Sean had met Kelsey and Kaylee once, just a short time after Kaylee was born. He thought Kelsey seemed like a nice young lady, and Kaylee was adorable, and he thought everything was going well. So on Thanksgiving, the the day of the murder, Sean and his wife and children went to their mother's house for dinner. They arrived at 2.30. Patrick wasn't there. According to Sean, Patrick called around 4.30 to say that he was on his way, and he showed up at 5 o'clock with Kaylee. But then he spent half of that evening outside doing chores. Right, so remember, Patrick lived there with his mother, so that was his home as well. So we don't know what he was out there doing. Well, he wasn't inside with his daughter. No. So Frazee told Sean on December 3rd that Kelsey was missing. So that's like 10 days after. He said that Cheryl Barreth had contacted the police and she had filed the missing persons report. Sean also said that Patrick had explained that Kelsey's grandmother was sick and she may have been off visiting her. He also told Sean that they had separated, but he didn't say when that had happened, because he told the police that it happened on the 22nd. But he didn't say that to his brother, and that's probably because when he showed up for Thanksgiving dinner, he hadn't mentioned that at all. Exactly. So there was a big search done looking for Kelsey's body, more than one. Investigators searched the Midway Landfill, from February to April, for Kelsey's body or any evidence related to her death, but nothing pertinent was found there. Still, they went ahead with the trial. I mean, they certainly had enough. So do you think they had enough without Crystal Kenny, or do you think they really needed her? Because prosecution seemed to think they needed her testimony. Well, you know, hindsight's so good. They probably didn't need her. Because I think if, if you look at all the evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, It's pretty clear what had happened. I think so. But there were things that they didn't know about when they gave her that deal. So I guess they kind of gave it to her prematurely, but they felt like there was no other choice because her attorney said she wasn't going to talk at all unless she got that deal. So Frazee's trial began this past November. The jury was initially five women and seven men, but then with the alternates and everything, it ended up being six of each. There were eight charges, including first-degree murder, tampering with the deceased body, and solicitation. And he pled not guilty to the charges. Kenny took her plea deal, and 
what that involved was just pleading guilty to a tampering charge and agreeing to testify. So it's a golden deal. Certainly is. Although I don't know how she can live with herself. And I would imagine she needs to leave town and change her name. I would think. Uh, although she lives up in Idaho. Right. Maybe she'll just disappear someplace. Yeah. I just, if it was a cousin of mine or a friend of mine and I heard what she did, I wouldn't have anything to do with her. I mean, it's really pretty fucking scary. Yes, it is. I don't care if she committed the murder or not. Just someone cold-hearted enough to clean the condo, to be there for the burning, to lie to the police. Not a good person. No, not at all. So some of the first witnesses in the trial were Kelsey's mother and the police that had been involved in the investigation. Patricia Key, who was the manager of the ENT Credit Union in Woodland Park, testified that Patrick Frazee came into the bank on December 8th and asked if he could see her surveillance footage from the bank's ATM from Thanksgiving Day. Yeah, right. So I'm thinking he was worried that they'd be able to see the container or something in the footage? Yeah, well, he was worried that there was some incriminating stuff on the footage, right? Right, yeah. And during her conversation with him, she said she could access the surveillance video from his trip to the bank on Thanksgiving. But according to her, Frazee said he was needing to have a timeline for that day because he and his fiance had broken up the day before. So he was getting together yeah. with her to see about custody of their child, he said, and he needed to set a timeline for where he was the day before. And then later on, he added that she was missing. So Key just had a bad feeling about him. And, well, you know, she'd heard about of, it. It's kind of a bullshit story to begin with. Yes. And people know she's missing. Yeah. Yeah. It's well known. I mean, it was national news. Now, that same day, Key said she had talked to police who had asked her to look up Kelsey's debit card history. Now, the last transaction was November 22nd, 2018. And that's the only day she said Frazee asked for surveillance footage showing his whereabouts. Yeah, so the whole timeline idea yeah. makes no sense. So she said that Frazee asked for his bank history that day as well and looked at surveillance video and photos that showed him at the ATM with his one-year-old daughter in the car. So Key said when Frazee left the bank, she contacted the company's legal team and they told her to write a synopsis of the interaction and call the police. Some of the conversations she had with Frazee struck her as very odd. Oh, she, yeah. More than odd. And she said he was very abrupt, and he never showed any concern for Kelsey or where she could be. Yeah, well, because this cell phone data was a big part of the evidence, a Verizon store employee testified, and he testified about an interaction with Frazee before Frazee's arrest. His name was David Felice. And he said Frazee came to the Woodland Park Verizon store on December 11th with his one-year-old daughter. And when he came in, he seemed very nervous and a bit sketchy, Felice said. Felice also said that Frazee seemed particularly concerned about the security of his cell phone account and asked if it was possible to get information from a phone if it was destroyed. Now, none of this is suspicious, huh? <laughs> none at all. So Felice said Frazee kept asking about the other phone on his account and tried to change the pin on that device so he could access its data. So, of course, that was Kelsey's phone. Right. So he's starting to worry a little bit about his phone records now. Too late. So District Attorney's investigator Chad Meininger testified about the surveillance photos from Kelsey's neighbor's motion-triggered surveillance cameras. One of these was pointed right at Kelsey's front door. So on November 22nd, which was the last day Kelsey had been seen alive, the surveillance camera was triggered 27 times. Frazee was in 11 of the surveillance photos, including one taken around 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah, so basically he was coming and going. Yes, he was. He had previously said he didn't go into Kelsey's condo that day at all, right? They just exchanged Kaylee in the alley. So in surveillance photos, Frazee isn't carrying anything out of the home except for Kaylee that they can see. But his back was often to the camera. And Minninger testified that the last image recorded of Kelsey was taken as she went into her apartment at 1.23 p.m. She was never seen leaving the apartment or the condo. So the police officer who called Frazee after Kelsey was first reported missing 
said there were two things that seemed to miss to her during their 15-minute phone conversation. One was the lack of concern, and the other is that he wouldn't give a date on the exchange of Kaylee at that point. That's interesting. It is, yeah. Kelsey's mother, Cheryl, testified that after her conversation with Frazee on December 2nd, and that's the day she had called the police and reported her daughter missing, she never heard from him again. She said he never went to the candlelight vigil for her daughter and didn't reach out to any member of the family, ever. So that's always such a bad sign. I mean, if he can't even face the family, he knows he's guilty, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I just can't imagine what the family would go through in that situation. It had to be just such a horror. And Cheryl also described strange things about the text messages she'd received from Kelsey's phone. Remember I said the texting just didn't seem like the way Kelsey texted. Everybody kind of has their own style of texting. Right. This didn't fit the syntax. Right. So Kelsey's texting style was also an issue for her boss at DOS Aviation. Raymond Sebring, one of her supervisors, said he was somewhat taken aback to receive a text from his normally dependable employee on November 25th saying she needed to take a week off to visit her grandmother. She'd never done anything like that before. Also, Kelsey's mother hadn't heard anything about going to the grandmother's, which she certainly would have. Sebring showed a list of unanswered texts he'd sent to Kelsey's phone, asking when she'd return to work and if she'd like to take paid time off for the unexpected week off. But, you know, he never heard back from her, of course. After the 25th, the phone had been destroyed or thrown in the water or something. It was never recovered. So I guess one of the biggest witnesses, of course, was Crystal Lee Kenny. I mean, she was the one that they were waiting for to really put everything together. Yeah, and she did. She testified basically what she had already told police, including what Frazee had told her were Kelsey's last words. And those were, please stop. Yeah, so she didn't just get hit once and pass out. No. No, she was awake for this horrible beating, or conscious for it. So Kenny was on the stand for over four hours. Also, the prosecutor submitted two videos from a body camera to show the court. And in a video, Kenny was talking with police. She was wearing a police jacket and sunglasses. And Frazee watched this video from his seat in the courtroom. Crystal looked down and didn't watch herself. In the video, an agent asked Kenny to describe the black tote, which she did, including some details about the clasps and the hinged lid. When asked where Frazee burned it, she said it was in a round aluminum water trough that didn't have a bottom to it, so it was on the dirt. She pointed out to them where she first parked when she got to Frazee's ranch on November 24th, noting that she got out and talked with him for at least an hour and he told her he needed to do chores and take care of Kaylee. So these people are just freaks, right? These are cold-blooded freaks. Absolutely. This is just so awful. I mean, there's no way that Kelsey could have imagined he was capable of this. She just couldn't have. I mean, I think he did have a pretty dark side, but I don't know if she'd seen it all, at least not until her death. Also in the video, Kenny said that Frazee had given her Kelsey's phone before she drove to Woodland Park, Then back to a Conoco station. She described how she and Frazee drove between Nash Ranch, Woodland Park, and the Frazee Ranch. In the video, they also walked toward where Kenny had parked that day, and she pointed out the area where Kelsey's body had been burned. There were some marks on the dirt from burning. So when she was asked if the discolored dirt had changed since she last saw it, she didn't really see a major difference. And she pointed out a nearby container and said that it was identical to the black tote that Kelsey's body was burned in. So this evidence, this testimony, is extremely damning to Frazee. It certainly was. So Kenny also said that she'd brought the trash bags from Kelsey's home, the bloody items and stuff, to add to the fire. She said she was present when Frazee first started the fire, and in the video she was seen showing authorities where Frazee got the wood to add to the fire. So in addition to the wood, Kenny said Frazee also had gas and motor oil ready. She took authorities to where Frazee had them sitting out that day. She said she had only she only saw one red gas can. She said that Frazee used just a single match, 
to light the trough's contents on fire. Yeah, so in the second video, she described everything she took from Kelsey's home during the cleanup and detailed what she'd been wearing when she did that. Also, she talked about what she'd put in trash bags, including her clothing. The defense worked in the cross-examination to show that Kenny had several opportunities to tell police about Frazee's plans to murder Kelsey and how she'd been able to plead guilty to tampering with evidence before even giving a formal statement to the authorities. He noted she hadn't pled guilty for the cleanup, for sending the messages from Kelsey's phone, or for destroying evidence. She wasn't charged with being an accessory to the murder either, which of course would carry a much more severe penalty. He continued grilling her about how prosecutors allowed her to plead guilty to the tampering charge only, and how she could end up with just probation after this. Then he pushed her on her claims that she felt afraid of Frazee, even though she lived like a thousand miles away in Idaho, and she was going to his place all the time. I know. So what the defense was really trying to say that she had done it. That was really his only defense, was to blame it on her. Yeah, but it's not going to work. No. So Kenny said that during an October visit, she told Frazee she was not going to commit the murder. She added that after not hearing from Frazee between October 21st and November 3rd, she hoped that he had given up on his plan. But the defense attorney got Kenny to admit that she spoke with Frazee again the day before Thanksgiving, and that she had willingly gone to clean up Kelsey's condo after Thanksgiving. So Frazee's close friend, Joe Moore, testified that Frazee was acting strangely in early 2018. This was months before Kelsey's murder. And he reported that he was so concerned he started taking notes about Frazee's behavior. He testified that on April 26, 2018, he asked Frazee about Kelsey, and Frazee replied, I figured out a way to kill her, adding, if there's no body, there's no crime. So he took notes, but he didn't go to anyone either. Yeah, so what's with this guy? I don't know. I mean, I guess just not thinking it'll really happen. It's the only thing I can think of. But, you know, he was also saying that after the murder, Frazee had said things like, well, if I'd known it was going to be such a big deal, I wouldn't have done it. You know, so basically, <laughs> he thought he was just going to get away with this. It wasn't going to make the national news. He seemed surprised about the publicity and what a big thing it had become. So it just shows me someone who really doesn't respect life, especially the life of a woman. I mean, basically, this no body, no crime. He thought, well, as long as I get rid of the body, I'm free and clear. Yeah. That's what he thought, anyway. Yeah, but there was a big surprise when a former Teller County jail inmate testified. I mean, this was, as Nancy Grace would say, a bombshell. It was. I mean, this, this inmate who was, had been in the same pod as Frazee from September 26 to October 12th of 2019 testified that Frazee tried to hire him to murder witnesses. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So this inmate turned over 17 letters to the prosecution of what he says are correspondence between him and Frazee. These letters included Frazee asking the inmate more than once to murder Crystal Lee. So she had a, a right to be afraid of him. Frazee also asked if the man knew where to find Crystal, her best friend, her ex-husband, her siblings, or her children, and other people expected to testify against him. Yeah, so... Yes, she could be afraid of him, but wouldn't it be better to have him locked up and prevent him from killing another young woman? I mean, didn't she see that Kelsey's life was just as valuable as her own? That's what gets me. Yeah. In one letter, Frazee suggested where Kenny could be found. Someone who tells FBI she came three times to kill Kelsey because I said so is BS. A thousand miles away on your dime, leaving family, job, etc. Then another note read, they all need to disappear unseen until November 22nd after trial. And then another one said, I'm not the monster they say I am. Well, the one that really got to me is the one that said, uh, do you have funds or resources to go to Idaho and back? Was thinking if you could cap them in the desert, then you could head home. Crystal Lee and Michelle, the BFF. So pretty much saying, shoot them in the desert, leave them there. Yeah. Crystal and her friend. And just the fact that he's asking if he has funds and resources means this isn't just daydreaming. This is a concrete plan he's trying to set into action. 
He also wrote flush on some of the notes, you know, saying that the other inmates should flush these letters down the toilet. But the inmate kept the letters. He said that he did this because he thought if Frazee ever became famous, he could sell the letters on eBay. Yeah, that's a good thought. <laughs> right. Jeez. Yeah. So not the greatest motivation to keep them, but he did keep them. Yeah. I mean, only only because he thought he could score some money off of them. Yeah, I know. I, just... I know. That's the sad part. Yeah. So Greg Slater, who is an investigator for the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, testified that he recognized Frazee's handwriting based on other pieces of evidence collected. Frazee's defense was that Kenny killed Kelsey and lied to the police to save herself. Yeah, but that pretty much fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think anyone liked her. And she cried on the stand. But it certainly didn't exonerate him at all. No. And he didn't testify. You know, that's no surprise. No. And the jury deliberated for less than four hours before reaching their verdict. It's always a bad sign for the defense when it's quick. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I think so. So he was found guilty on all charges. Two counts of murder, three counts of solicitation to commit murder, and tampering with a deceased human body. He was sentenced to life without parole for first-degree murder, plus an additional 156 years. Yeah, so he's not going anywhere. <laughs> no. No. Thank God, because he's a scary guy, right? Terrible. I mean, one of the prosecutors on the case, Beth Reed, said that she never witnessed Frazee express anything other than this emotionless state that he showed in court, just a blank face. And she believes he's a sociopath. Now, she's not a psychiatrist, but he sure seems like one. I'll agree with her there. Yeah. So we did find a little background about him, and they had a little bit on the Dateline episode. Yeah. They had a former girlfriend of Frazee's who was interviewed on the Dateline episode, and this girlfriend said he'd like to play mind games with her and threaten her. She also said he was cruel to his animals and frequently talked about killing people. Girlfriend's name is Vanessa Curie. And she said that Frazee had severe anger issues, which he blamed on a difficult childhood. Now, it certainly does appear that he emotionally manipulated Crystal Lee Kenny. Yeah, but she's still responsible well, for her actions. As you said. Yes. She's going to be sentenced later this month, but the maximum she's going to get is three years. If she had taken a plea for accessory to murder, she could have gotten a sentence of life in prison. Right, but I guess the prosecution wasn't sure that they could get a conviction without her cooperation. But looking back, I think they probably could have. Or given her a plea deal that wasn't quite, you know, such a easy one with such a low sentence, right? Such a light right. sentence. Are you allowed? I mean, if, if you've made this agreement, this plea deal, can you go back on it? Or is that engraved in stone? I don't know. I know that the prosecution can if she lied and didn't follow through. It could be canceled. Right. Right? But, but suppose they decided at trial or after trial that she was much more involved than she claimed to be. So they say, okay, we're, we're revoking our plea deal, and we're going to charge you with accessory to murder or something like that. But I, that's a moot point. Well, it seems unlikely. I don't know if it's moot, because if it were a thing, maybe it could happen. But we'd have to hear from one of our lawyer friends to be sure. But I'm pretty sure it's almost written in stone, right? Because there are plenty of people who've appealed after making a plea, and I've never seen that work. Right. Now, Kelsey's parents filed a civil suit against Frazee for wrongful death, negligence, civil conspiracy, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. So that's ongoing right now. Kaylee is in the custody of Kelsey's parents, and they plan to adopt her. Yeah. Sad case. Oh, uh, just horrendous. It really is. I mean, it's brutal, isn't it? It's awful. I'm just so glad that he'll never be out. I mean, and then the whole planning to kill people from prison, that just shows you he really is horribly evil. Yeah. You know, just doesn't think twice about taking someone's life. Nope. Which, of course, you know, he took away his daughter's mother. So if he's willing to do that, he would be willing to kill anyone. So some references for this case were State of Colorado documents, including search warrants, uh, Frazee's arrest warrant, and other attachments. 
We also got a great deal of information from Denver 7 from Dateline NBC. They had an episode, season 27, episode 23. 48 Hours had two episodes, season 32, episode 3, and episode 12. Episode 12 was after the trial, kind of an update episode, which I think is kind of cheating because half of that episode is old stuff from the first episode, and they do a lot of rehashing, not my favorite. Our intro and outro music was written and produced by Tristan Capel, so thank you, Tristan. If you haven't joined Team Tie Grabber, I'd just like to say it's worth considering. We recently tackled the story of Amber Hilberling, a young wife accused of pushing her husband out of a window, 25 stories up. Our commercial-free members-only episodes come out each and every month, plus there's a backlog of about 40 episodes that are all yours to listen to as soon as you become a member. Recent episodes include the murder of Adrian Reynolds, John List's family murders, A.B. Shermer, the wife-killing preacher, Christopher Porco, who went after his parents with an axe, and the list goes on and on. I was thinking the other day there are some older ones I really think are quite good that I'm proud of, like our O.J. Simpson series. Also, our interview with a scuba expert in Australia about the underwater death of newlywed Tina Watson, one of my favorite episodes. He was just fascinating, so knowledgeable. And you can be a Tie Grabber member for as little as $4 a month. When you join, you have your choice of a welcome gift as well, which we'll send to you with a very nice handwritten thank you note because we appreciate you that much. Just go to tiegrabber.com and click on subscribe to learn more. I'd also mention, just because we haven't done it for a while, if you want to do some shopping for some merchandise, there's an excellent place on the website and you can learn all about Tea Public and all the great stuff they have. Right, just click on Shop the Brewery on our website. Yeah, and you will be amazed at the variety of things. Yeah, I think people are surprised when they click on it because people write to me and ask, where can I get, you know, a True Crime Brewery t-shirt or stuff like that? And then when I tell them to go there, they're like, oh, so we probably should let people know about that once in a while. Well, I'm just just figuring that it's the new year. We hadn't done it for a while. Throw it in. Sure. Okay, Dick, I hear you have some good feedback today. The dogs were telling me all about it earlier. So what have we got? Well, I got a few emails today. Okay, why don't you read the first one? So this is from Jerry, who has a case suggestion and a beer suggestion. So he says, I'm a new listener. and so very glad I found your channel. As a criminology major, I, of course, find true crime very interesting. I watch a ton of true crime documentaries. My case suggestion is to discuss the crimes of serial killer Larry Eiler. He's also known as the interstate killer or the highway killer. He's believed to have killed at least 21 teenage boys and young men between 1982 and 1984 in the Midwestern United States, mostly Indiana and Illinois. And there's a book called Freed to Kill, the true story of Larry Eiler. Very interesting. The sad fact is that he was once arrested on charges, but then was released because Indiana law enforcement illegally detained him, and this caused all the evidence collected by Illinois law enforcement to be thrown out. So he was released only to continue his horrible crimes. And it wasn't until he tortured and murdered a 16-year-old boy named Daniel Bridges that he was arrested for a second time. So that sounds like an interesting case. He goes on, he wants to have a beer from the Terre Haute Brewing Company, been in operation since 1837, so it's one of the original nine commercial breweries in the United States, and the second oldest operating brewery in the United States. So he's got a beer called Madam Brown, which is a British brown ale, English brown ale, thinks it's very good. So I'm all set. I've got a case and a beer ready to go. Now, I know that you just edited the hell out of that, but it seems like he does a beer review like you, right? He's got some stuff in there about bready, toasty, malty. So he seems like he might be a bit of a beer expert. He does, yeah. yes. So you guys would probably like to talk. You guys would get along great. Well, if we talk about beer, it's always a fun subject. <laughs> well, for you, yeah, not for everybody. <laughs> but for you and probably for Jerry. So thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thanks a lot. 
So the next email is from Christine with a case suggestion. Love and admiration for a well-presented podcast, not to mention your fabulous banter. Just watch the Teresa Sivers murder trial. She was a Florida doctor of holistic medicine. Three horrible killings for insurance money. Mark, her husband, orchestrated the whole thing. His two best friends hammered her to death. So that sentence was a little weird, but you get the gist. Yeah, so she's a practitioner of holistic medication. Teresa Sievers. Teresa Sievers. Right. She was found bludgeoned to death in her Florida home. She had been in New York with her husband and children over the weekend, and she had come home alone because she was due to work the next day. Now, her husband was not a suspect initially, but as they were investigating the murder, they found evidence that she and her husband had what would be considered an open marriage, and he had a $4 million life insurance policies on her. So, little motive there. He and two friends of his were charged with the murder. As Christine said, the trial is ongoing. So, was he a doctor? Nope. Sounds brutal. So, we'll definitely look into that. Thanks, Christine. I want to see how much information I can get on that, because uh, the initial lookup I did didn't have too much. I'll see, see if we can find some more. Okay. So we have a case suggestion from Mary Ann. Hi, Jill and Dick. I'm contacting you about a case from 2006 known as the Richmond Spree Murders or the Harvey Family and Baskerville Family Murders. As I am from Richmond, I've been aware of this case since the beginning. However, I've never found any television media and virtually no internet media about them, which seems so odd since these murders were quite sensational. On January 1st of 2006, as the Harvey family was getting ready for a New Year's Day party, Ricky Gray and Ray Dandridge, uncle and nephew but close in age, got into the Harvey home and murdered them all, including their four-year-old and nine-year-old daughters. Parents, Kathy and Brian, were well known in Richmond as he was a local musician of some notoriety, and she owned a popular shop called World of Mirth. Ashley Baskerville was, for a short time, Ray Dandridge's girlfriend. The men stayed with the Baskerville family around the time of the Harvey murders. Days later, they murdered the Baskerville family, including Ashley. There are many more details to this case that are fascinating. As an aside, Kathy Harvey was half-sister to actor Stephen Culp, well-known from the TV show Desperate Housewives. I really hope you will choose to do this on your podcast and bring it the attention it deserves. Thank you, Marianne. Well, thanks, Marianne. I am really shocked I haven't heard of this. This is really crazy. It is. Wiped out two families. And the other thing, some of the research I was doing, one of them, either Ricky Gray or Ray Dandridge, I can't remember which, is also thought to have murdered his mother. Wow. So these are two nuts, two psychopaths. Absolutely. But interesting. It's another, another one that I want to see how much information I can get. Yeah, let's do that. We'll look. Okay. So why don't you read our final email for today? I will, and this will be a quick one. This is from Trina, case suggestion. Hey, from Compton, California. I've been listening to you all for about a year now, and I'm obsessed. I used to listen to another podcast, but it was making me paranoid and giving me nightmares. <laughs> Surprisingly, I love true crime, but I'm a bit scary, however. Your podcast is not scary at all. <laughs> and I feel at ease, relaxed, and informed while listening. Please research the disturbing case of Luke Magnata of Canada. He actually recorded himself murdering and dismembering a victim and uploading it on YouTube. I regret watching, although happy the clarity from 2009-2010 wasn't as good as it is today, or I might be traumatized. He also uploaded videos of himself killing animals. I'd love to hear you and Jill discuss. Stay married, stay cute, and stay my faves. Well, Thanks, I, Trina. I think we can do that. Yeah, we're not scary at all. Yeah. Now, the reason I put this in, because we've had several people suggest this one. Well, we even got a book and read it and decided we, we weren't going to do it. That's what I wanted to say. It, yeah. It's just too gross. It's gross, and the randomness of it, I don't feel like it gives us a lot to discuss, because we really like to discuss people's history, motivations. At least I do. That's how I feel about it. And the randomness of this sociopath just really didn't appeal to me. I mean, we'll keep it on the back burner, Trina, but it's not one that's really a priority for us right now, at least. It certainly isn't. And it, it might not ever be. It might not be. But we appreciate your email. And if you have any other cases, we'd love to hear about 
what you think we should do for another case. We're always open to case suggestions. Absolutely. Yep. We can never have too many. You go through them and sometimes there are a lot that don't appeal. You're right. Yep. Okay. Finish your beer. Let's head home. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening. We'll see you next week at the quiet end. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.